Hello and welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Transfer Switch Fundamentals, Features and Functions Overview, sponsored by Cummins. I'm your moderator, Amara Rasgis, and I'm glad to join you on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology. Here are some tips and tricks to get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or with the audio, refresh your browser or click on the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by controlling the volume on your own device or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to ask, access a list of system checks. But if you do need a technician, please type a question in the ask a question box and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Individual user experience questions will be answered in the answered questions box. You can type questions for the speaker in that same ask a question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin in about 45 minutes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You'll receive an email within about a week to the on-demand version in case you wanna go back and refer to anything. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. These documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. All right, well, let me now introduce today's presenter, Chad Hale. Chad Hale is a graduate of Purdue University who's been with Cummins since June 2019. He brings with him a background in global supply chain management, technical development, and sales. Now with Cummins, he supports the technical marketing team. Thanks for presenting today, Chad. Let's start. All righty. Thank you, Amara, for that wonderful introduction. Um, like I said, or not like I said, before I hop into the presentation, um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, as Amara stated, my name is Chad Hale, and I did graduate from Purdue University in 2019, where I do have a background in some global supply chain management, some sales, um, dabbled in a lot of things. Uh, but ultimately, when I graduated in 2019, I joined Cummins, um, and now while with Cummins, I have worked within the technical marketing department as a technical marketing specialist to help develop and deliver power hours and webinars such as this one uh, you guys are about to witness, as well as white papers and other content related to Cummins products and services. Um, however, if there are any fellow Boilermakers in the chat, feel free to go ahead and chime in. Always love seeing fellow Purdue graduates, uh, whether that's alongside me or in the, in the chat box. So now that, uh, uh, you know a little bit more about me. Let's go ahead and jump into this presentation. So for starters, uh, as always, I just want to provide a little bit of a disclaimer on things that I will be discussing because we will be discussing things such as codes and standards like NFPA and UL 1008. So the views and opinions expressed in this course shall not be considered the official position of any regulatory organization and shall not be considered to be nor be relied upon as formal interpretation. Participants are encouraged to refer, refer to the entire text of all reference documents. In addition, when in doubt, reach out to your authority having jurisdiction, otherwise known as your AHJ. So today's uh, presentation is all about transfer switch basics and fundamentals. So transfer switches are a vital piece of the puzzle to any electrical power system, available in a variety of types with a wide array of options. It is important to understand that these features and functions uh, for the success of any power system. Um, and in this webcast, we will review the basics of automatic transfer switch fundamentals. Hopefully at the end of the presentation, everyone will be able to walk away with the ability to describe the basic operational features and functions of a working transfer switch. So how they switch um, different transition types, uh, like I said, so recognizing the different transition types, installation types, as well as application types. 
Um, so where they belong in a system, as well as to what application you would have this in, have them in, so like healthcare or standby, things like that. And then lastly, identify the codes and standards associated with transfer switch operations. Like I said, right before the disclaimer, we will be discussing things as such as NFPA and UL 1008. So why exactly is a transfer switch needed? Data centers, hospitals, factories, and a wide range of other facilities that require continuous or near continuous uptime common, commonly used an emergency power source. You might recognize those emergency power sources uh, as generators or other utilities, utilities being redundant in those situations. This then creates a need for something to monitor and transfer the power between these sources which is exactly what a transfer switch does. An automatic transfer switch is responsible for quickly and safely transitioning all electrical power consumed by a circuit, equipment, or systems connected to the transfer switch output between those normal and emergency power sources. So now that there's a little bit of an understanding of why is a transfer switch needed, let's focus on what a transfer switch does. So. A transfer switch transfers power between two sources. Typically, this will look like an automatic transfer switch transferring power between a normal source, which would be your utility in many circumstances, to an emergency source during an outage. That emergency source most likely being a backup generator, which would look something like this. So in an outage, the normal power source fails. And then next up, when the power from the generator or backup utility feed is stable and within the prescribed voltage and frequency tolerances, the transfer switch shifts the electrical load to the emergency power source. Depending on the facility's needs and preferences, that transfer either occurs automatically or is executed manually. When the utility power is restored, the transfer switch returns the load from the emergency power source to the normal power source. So going from that utility to gen, and then power comes back on, and then you switch from gen to utility. Again, once again, this can happen automatically or manually, depending on the type of switch being used in this operational mode. This ability to transfer power between sources also allows for the means of transferring loads between two power sources allows testing of generator sets, allows for shedding of non-critical loads, and allows stepping of loads onto a single generator. Um, and as you can see off to those points to the right, there are a few more uh, circumstances and situations that an automatic transfer switch can be used for. So next up is transfer switch functionality. Let me take a drink of water. Now that we have established the what and the why, Let's step into some high-level functions of a transfer switch and how they work a little bit more in depth. So, for starters, we have that load transfer between sources. This is what you will most commonly see with automatic transfer switches. You will have a switch that is monitoring the quality of two sources, those two sources most likely being a normal source of utility, and then you have the ATS monitoring the emergency source that is your backup generator. If a source fails, the automatic transfer switch will go through the proper steps of transferring power from the normal source to the emergency store source to restore power to the loads, those loads being things such as lights, exit signs, um, critical equipment, things like that. And then next we have load shedding. So load shedding is when you have a transfer switch monitoring the alternate power source if an overload event occurs, the transfer switch will start shedding the non-critical loads. Keep in mind that in this case, it is highly recommended to use a three position transfer switch because you will have that neutral position or that uh, center off position, which we will discuss later on in the presentation. And then lastly, we have something called load sequencing. This is when you have a system with multiple AC a automatic transfer switches within your system. And within the system, you can adjust the transition delays within your transfer switches to ensure that your emergency loads are receiving power first. And then as you move into those delays and those other transfer switches, um, your more non-critical, uh, non-emergency loads will be receiving power from those transfer switches. 
So next up, we have different types of transfer switches. So as you can see here on the screen, on the far left, we have our automatic transfer switch. In the middle, we have our non-automatic transfer switch. And then finally, on the far right, we have a manual transfer switch. And I will briefly break down the differences between all three here in just a second. So to start off this discussion, I will first go over the automatic transfer switch, which is that transfer switch all the way off to the left there on this slide. In this switch, you have uh, a controller, and there is an autonomous function where the controller will monitor the quality and availability of the power source. So power source is, once again, being your normal and emergency. And if needed, the control will decide when to transfer power from one source to another. A typical sequence of operation would look like your loads are being powered by the utility. Then there is an outage or a power disruption of some kind. Your transfer switch then detects that the power loss and there is a power loss and will send a signal to the generator or your emergency power source to start up. Once the generator is ready to load, the automatic transfer switch will then initiate the transfer to the backup source. Once again, that backup source being that generator. And then once power is restored or you are able to switch back to the utility, the automatic transfer switch will sense, uh, sense that and then it will transfer from the emergency power source back to the normal power source, and then we'll send a signal to the generator to shut down. Here in the middle, we have the non-automatic transfer switch. The main difference between these two is they look similar and they sound similar in their names, um, it, but is that the automatic transfer switch is that there is some level of human involvement when it comes to the switching of the power sources. So when either a local or remote actuation, uh, so sorry, so either a local or remote actuation will be needed to switch sources for the non-automatic transfer switch. Please keep in mind that for this type of switch, that the switching mechanism is used in these switches uh, to switch from one source to the other is still operated electrically. Um, so as you can see, there's that little hand there pushing the button, uh, the electrical switch. So the difference between that and an automatic is that the switch is either done locally or through a remote, remote uh, actuation. And then lastly, off to the far right there with the little guy standing next to the transfer switch is our manual transfer switches. So these switches can be operated to switch between power sources at any given time. Uh, while this surely simplifies the design, it is important to recognize that manual transfer switches typically are not equipped with devices to monitor the acceptability of voltage, frequency, or phase angle differences on the alternating current circuits that they connect. Consequently, this means that they work best in applications where the transfers between two live sources are unlikely or unnecessary or systems can tolerate differences in electrical characteristics of power sources and load circuits. Other considerations include that the manual transfer switch must be located where they can be accessed easily and that they cannot be controlled from a remote location. So once again, automatic transfer switch has that uh, ability to transfer power on its own. Uh, Non-automatic in the middle is either locally or uh, controlled by remote actuation. And then lastly, that manual transfer switch is done by human interaction. So what are the different types of transfer switches? We, on this slide, we have a service entrance rated transfer switch. Uh, and then on the right here, we have bypass isolation. So this is just once again going to more differences of the types of transfer switches. So I will cover the service entrance rated transfer switch, which is off to the left there. When looking into transfer switches and their functionality, it is important to understand the difference between a service entrance, service rated transfer switch and a non-service entrance rated transfer switch. So for starters, what is a service disconnect? And what does it mean? Well, uh, it is exactly a service entrance disconnect is a device that interrupts excessive voltage and allows for manually disconnecting your home or business from the electrical utility via that integrated service disconnect. Now, what defines a disconnect device is a circuit breaker that either forms part of your utility meter base or the main panel, which is also commonly referred to as the main breaker. 
this is great and this is awesome, uh, but what exactly makes this a service rated automatic transfer switch? That would be the ability for a transfer switch to have the breaker added in series with the utility input and binding jumper between the neutral and ground, all of which must be in accordance with UL 1008, which is one of those codes that I referenced and we'll be discussing a little later on in the presentation. And to cover those non-service entrance rated automatic transfer switches, they are any automatic transfer switch that is not capable of doing any of the items mentioned above. And for those that are visual learners, oops, sorry. Um, and then lastly, uh, is that bypass transfer switch, which is off to the right there with once again, uh, the little human standing next to it. So lastly, we have this bypass isolation transfer switch. A simple way of viewing a bypass isolation transfer switch is that you have two switches sandwiched together. And in this case of the, on, and in this diagram, uh, you have an automatic transfer switch on the bottom and a manual transfer switch also integrated into the switch itself. In normal circumstances, both will be connected. Uh, but for this instance, let's just say that there is a need to do some maintenance on the automatic transfer switch, or there is some other need to take the automatic transfer switch out of commission. What this bypass isolation transfer switch allows is you to separate the automatic transfer switch from the manual transfer switch side of things, but still allow the manual transfer of power between sources and the transfer switch. This is all possible due to a linking mechanism that allows you to isolate the two portions of the switch so that you can pull the automatic mechanism and fix and test whatever is needed within the automatic transfer switch. Um, so as you can see on the diagram, there's a little split in the middle. Um, so you have that automatic transfer switch on the bottom and the manual transfer switch on the top. Normally they are connected together, uh, but say if there is testing that needs to be done or you're doing maintenance on the transfer switch, you can split those and the manual transfer switch will still be connected to the emergency and uh, normal power source. If you need to transfer power, you can then normally, um, or not, sorry, you can manually transfer the power while the uh, manual transfer switch is still connected. So I mentioned it a little earlier on in the presentation, but we have something that is called a two position versus a three position switch. And I will briefly get into the differences of those two here in just a second. So when referring to a two position transfer switch, whether that's in a spec sheet or uh, in a piece of material, they are commonly referred to as a double throw uh, switch or a neutral position um, for a three position switch. The difference between these two switches is that the three position switch, which is off to the right there, uh, is designed with a center off position um, and you can see that displayed in the diagram. You have those three dots. On the left would be your normal source, and then on the far right is your emergency source, but in the middle there, um, there's that center dot, and that is what is known as your center off position or your neutral position. This allows for the switch to be disconnected from both sources of power. Uh, we will discuss this a later, little later on in the presentation, but this type of transfer switch is great for any open delayed transitions for emergency applications. This three position switch can also allow for load shedding because the neutral position that is once again in that center ensures that you will not transfer to a dead source. So just to briefly describe the main differences is on the left there is that two position switch. You just have the ability to transfer from the emergency to normal, whereas in the three position switch off to the right there, you have the uh, normal and then the center off and then the emergency source. Um, so switching to that uh, center off position allows for open delays transitions for emergency applications, as well as uh, allows for the ability to load shed. Next, I will briefly cover three pole versus four pole transfer switches and the differences between the two. So the differences between a three pole and a four pole transfer switch are that a three pole transfer switch has the three phases of A, B, and C, and a four pole is uh, switching all three phases and having that neutral ground neutral together simultaneously. Um, so if the ground fault protection is needed for your application, then you will need to use a four pole transfer switch. So 
I covered this uh, obviously very quickly, the difference between a three pole versus four pole. Uh, there are other topics that in presentations that have been done on grounding and three pole, three pole versus four pole. When you do receive this presentation, if you click on that link, it will take you to a power hour that is solely dedicated uh, to the more in-depth look onto three pole, three pole versus four pole and that grounding um, topic. So next up, uh, when looking at how transfer switches work, it is also important to understand what kind of applications your transfer switch is going into, as well as where that transfer switch sits inside that application. So for starters, we're gonna go top left and then top, bottom right, or bottom left and then so on and so forth on the right side. So we'll start off with utility to generator. This will be most applications that you all see. Uh, this is when you have a facility that relies on a normal source, usually being the utility, with a standby power system, usually being that generator, and the transfer switch transferring power between those two sources. So in a system you would typically see you have uh, the, the the emergency power source being the generator and then the utility being the normal and the ATS transferring between the two. Next up, you have gin to gin. Uh, this application type is most notably seen in prime power applications. This is where you have two generators being connected by an automatic transfer switch. So as you can see in that graphic, now instead of having that utility piece off to the left, you just have two generators um, and your automatic transfer switch monitoring the power between the two and then also transferring the power uh, between the two generators if needed. Next up in the top right of this slide is utility to utility. This is a very similar concept to mentioned just before this as gin to gin. So you'll have a facility that is being supplied by a uh, two redundant utility feeds, and then you will have that automatic transfer switch being used to monitor the power of both those feeds and transfer power between the two if needed. And then lastly, we have a three source system. So in a three source system, it requires two transfer switches and those uh, also these three sources can be a combination of many things. Uh, you could have two utilities with a generator or you could have the opposite of two gins and a utility. And then you have two transfer switches monitoring all the sources. So you'll have one transfer switch monitoring uh, source one, source two, and then another secondary transfer switch monitoring the source three, um, and then they can switch appropriately as needed if something goes wrong. Uh, something that is just as important as the application type is also the installation type, uh, which is what we will move into in this next part of the presentation. So to start off the installation type discussion, we will move into emergency uh, systems. So emergency systems supply and automatically distribute and control electricity used by systems essential to life safety during fires and other disasters. They include fire detectors, alarms, emergency lights, elevators, fire pumps, public safety communication systems, and ventilation systems. And you can commonly find these in hotels, theaters, sports arenas, and hospitals. Uh, emergency systems are regulated by municipal, state, federal, or other governmental agencies. Transfer from the normal power source to the emergency power source must be completed within 10 seconds and meet the requirements of Article 700 of the National Electric Code, otherwise known as NFPA 70, as well as in addition to overcurrent protection devices must be selectively coordinated with all supply side overcurrent protection devices. So if more information is needed about an emergency system and what it means, um, please take a look at NEC Article 700. You can find more details as to what is needed of your system and your automatic transfer switch as well. Next up is a legally required system. So what is a legally required system? This is a system that automatically supplies power to a selected set of regulated loads not classified as emergency systems when the normal power is unavailable. They serve critical heating, refrigeration, communication, ventilation, smoke removal, sewage disposal, and lighting functions that could create hazards or hamper rescue or firefighting operations if denied electrical 
power. Excuse me. As with emergency systems, legally required systems are also regulated by municipal, state, federal, and other governmental agencies. The transfer from the normal power source to the emergency power source must be complete within 60 seconds and meet the requirements of Article NEC Article 701 of the National Electric Code, once again, otherwise known as NFPA 70. And then the same situation applies with your OCPDs. Uh, they must be selectively coordinated with all supply side overcurrent protective devices. Next up on the list, we have critical operation operations power systems, otherwise known as COPS. Critical operations power systems, or COPS, supply, distribute, and control electricity in designated critical areas when normal power sources fail. They include HVAC, fire alarm, security, communication signaling, and other services and facilities that a government agency has deemed important to the national security, the economy, or public health and safety. All critical operations must meet the requirements of NEC Article 708 of the National Electric Code. Once again, same thing applies with your overcurrent protective devices. They must be selectively coordinated with all supply side OCPDs. So once again, here's your COPS supporting functions such as HVAC, fire alarms, security, and signaling. Lastly, we have the operational or optional standby systems. Optional standby. Uh, um, optional standby systems um, supply power to loads with no direct bearing on health or safety and are not required to function automatically during power failures. They are typically found in commercial buildings, farms, and even residences and must meet the requirements of Article 702 of the National Electric Code. Once again, known as NFPA 70. So now that we've covered everything from why to what to installation types and application types, it's time to get a little bit more technical with things and discuss how transfer switches actually transfer power um, through their different transition types. So first off, we have transition types. Uh, first up is on the list is open transition. Open transition is what you would call a break before you make transfer. This means that the automatic transfer switch is breaking connection to one of the power sources before making a connection to the other power source. So for a period between the disconnection and the connection, neither the normal power source nor the emergency power source will be giving electricity to the loads. So they will have a break in power. Um, to dive a, a little deeper into the open tra transition types, there are two types. Those two types being open delay transition and open in phase transition. In an open delay transition, when switching from the normal source to an emergency power source, the automatic transfer switch will pause. That delay typically lasts for a specific preset amount of time or however it long it takes the load voltage to drop below a pre-specified level. Now, this requires a three-position transfer switch like I discussed earlier. Uh, this is due to the fact that the three-position transfer switch allows for the automatic transfer switch to go into that center off or neutral position. So when you do have that delay, um, say the power source, uh, the power, the normal power source fails, uh, you have a delay built in, the transfer switch will then switch to that center off position. Once your delay has uh, gone past, it will then switch on to your emergency power source. The next is in phase transition. With in phase transition, there is an automatic controller that will be, uh, that will perform an open transition at the exact moment it expects the normal and emergency power sources to be synchronized in phase voltage and frequency, so all three of those things. These transitions are very fast and are finished within 150 milliseconds or less to ensure that the inrush current is equal or less than the normal starting current of the inductive loads. Like I said, there's two types of transitions, open and then the next is closed. So what is a closed transition? Like I said, 
what opens, it's a break before you make. However, the close is a make before you break style of transfer. And that the transfer switch will make a connection to the new power source before breaking its connection to the old one. This means that there is no gap between disconnection and connection. The downstream loads will receive continuous power throughout the transfer process. Switch is configured for closed transitions, usually transfer power automatically as soon as both sources are closely synchronized in phase, voltage, and frequency. The overlap period during which both sources are simultaneously connected or paralleled usually lasts no more than 100 milliseconds. Because of this, utilities may mandate additional safeguards, uh, which could add additional cost to your systems. So now that we've covered both the open and closed, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into those delay transition and in-phase transitions, and then lastly, uh, closed. So, in phase transition. In this graphic here, you can see that there are two live sources. Um, on the top, you have your utility. On the bottom, you have your gin. Um, on the far left of the diagram, uh, imagine that the automatic transfer switch starts to sense that there is something wrong with the normal source of power. So it wants to switch over to that emergency power source being that generator in the graphic. Uh, which is what we can see happening in the middle of this graphic. The automatic transfer switch has opened to the utility, which means that it has come off, um, which causes a brief interruption of power to your sources. And then, as you can see in the diagram, the load voltage has completely gone away. That means there is no more power to your loads. And then on the third part on the far right of the diagram, the automatic transfer switch has closed on to the emergency power supply, and then now you have power once again being restored to your loads. The break, like I said, the break in power is now over and you once again have uh, power to your loads. So that retransfer uh, will look pretty similar once your normal, the automatic transfer switch has, uh, since that your normal supply is good to go, um, it will open up to your emergency power supply being that generator. Um, there will be a brief interruption of power and then it will close back on to your normal source being the utility. So this type of transition will work for most applications. However, it is not suitable for applications with large motor loads. Uh, also, please keep in mind that on these types of transitions that on both the transferring of power and the retransferring of power, there will be a brief interruption to your loads as the automatic transfer switch opens and closes onto the normal emergency, normal and emergency power sources. Um, next up, we have our time delayed transitions, which is once again, part of uh, that open transition style. So here we can see the operating sequence of a program transition transfer switch. Notice that the load voltage decays slowly once the inductive loads have been disconnected from the power source. And that decay there is in the middle. Um, you can see the little squiggly lines going down. Uh, the program transition uh, transfer has a delay that allows the load generated voltage to decay to a safe voltage. It is important to understand that the transfer switch does not measure the residual voltage. It only creates a predetermined pause between switching to allow the residual voltage to decay. So um, here we can see on the far left of the diagram, you have your normal source in your backup gen, your gen's on, the automatic transfer switch realizes there's an issue with your normal source, it opens to the normal source, and then the automatic transfer switch goes into its program delay, which is that middle piece, you can see the voltage decaying once it has decayed to a uh, reasonable amount or until that time delay is over, it will then switch on to your emergency power source. Uh, this eliminates the feedback of residual voltage. So some things to note about this transition are that due to the rapid transfer time, there is a, a slight appreciable power interruption to your loads provided that the system is properly adjusted. Unlike in-phase transfer, this type of transfer is a great option for those large motor loads and allows for the step loading of generator sets. 
However, please keep in mind that you will need to have that three position transfer switch to accomplish this type of transfer. This is once again due to the need to have that center off position. So, like I said back in that slide in the middle piece, imagine you have that normal and emergency source, your normal source goes away. Um, however, you have those large, large motor loads on the other end of your transfer switch, so it opens to both sources in that center off position, um, has that time delay, and then once that time delay is up, it will switch from the center off to the emergency power source. Lastly, we have uh, closed transition. So here on the graphic, you can see there is two sources that are live, your normal and emergency. At some point during this event, the automatic transfer switch notices that the normal source of power is fluctuating, so it will want to transfer power over to your emergency source. To do that, it will close on to the emergency source before opening to the normal side. Uh, this will lead to no interruption of power if, quote, if both sources are live. Um, so you can see, you have the normal and backup in the middle. It closes onto both very briefly. Um, and then on the far right there, uh, you can see that it has finally closed on to the emergency power source and then opened itself to the normal source. And then there is hardly any interruption of power uh, to your loads. So once again, some things to note are that this is a make before you break transition, which is completely different than your open, which is a break before you make. So if transferring during a testing event, retransfer, retransfer, or when both sources are live, uh, then there will be no interruption of power. However, please remember, if only one source is available and there is a need to transfer, then there will still be an interruption of power to your loads. Um, this most likely being that 10 seconds, um, especially if you're in an FPA uh, 110 type 10 system, um, when you have 10 seconds uh, to get to the power to the load side of the transfer switch. So we've covered a lot of things from installation, application, the what and why, as well as some transition types. So it is also important to understand uh, what is going to be keeping your transfer switch safe and that is most likely going to be an enclosure. So what are the different types of enclosures and what do those types of enclosures mean for your automatic transfer switch in your system? Uh, and then once again, here are some more resources once you get the presentation. Uh, if you would like to click on those, it will take you to topics that are a little bit more in depth on the transition types and styles of transfer switches. So like I just mentioned, let's go ahead and talk about enclosures. Enclosures play an important role into any transfer switch application as they are there to protect your automatic transfer switch from many things. The rating systems for enclosures are defined by NEMA. Uh, for an indoor applications, you have the NEMA type one and the NEMA type 12 enclosure, which are there on your screen. Um, I'm going to talk about the type one first. So the type one is a general purpose enclosure that is constructed for indoor use. This enclosure will protect against dust, light, and indirect splashing. However, note that it is not dust tight and primarily serves the purpose of protecting the switch from incidental contact. So that would be like, say, if you're in the room, um, where your system is, uh, protect from contact, whether that's you swinging something around or something else in the enclosure breaking down and maybe accidentally hitting it. Type 12 enclosures provide a degree of protection of the equipment inside the enclosure against ingress of solid foreign objects, uh, those solid foreign objects being falling dirt, circulating dust, lint, and other fibers. The type 12 also provides a degree of protection with respect to harmful effects on equipment due to the ingress of water, so dripping and light splashing. Gasketed door seals uh, seals the enclosure's content from airborne contamination in non-pressurized water and oil. Um, so the big differences between the type 1 type 12 being you have those gasketed seals allowing for a little bit more protection between dust, uh, heavier dirt, as well as light water 
in oil, um, but does not protect against pressurized water or oil. So keep that in mind. So those are the indoor enclosures. Now let's talk about outdoor enclosures and what that means for your automatic transfer switch. So these are still NEMA type enclosures. Um, however, there's a little bit more and they provide a little bit more protection. So for starters, there is the NEMA 3R, which is off to the far left there on this slide. This, can, this enclosure is intended for outdoor use. The 3R enclosures provide a degree of protection against falling rain and ice formation. Um, these are constructed with knockouts on the sides and bottom of the case to prevent beating rain from interfering with successful operation of the apparatus or results in wetting of live parts and wiring within the enclosure under specified conditions. Please note that these enclosures are not rain tight, which means that in the case of hard rain um, or any kind of pressurized water or oil, there could be water leaking into the enclosure. The 3R does not have those gasketed surfaces, meaning if subjected once again to a stream of water that is pressurized or really hard, uh, that water could enter into your enclosure and cause damage to the internal components of your transfer switch. In the middle there, we have the type four as specified by NEMA. Um, this is a weather tight enclosure. It is constructed for either indoor or outdoor use to provide a degree of protection against falling dirt, rain, sleet, snow, wind blown dust, splashing water and hose directed water and will be undamaged by external formation of ice on the enclosure. And then lastly, we have our type 4X enclosure. The type 4X enclosures are the same as the type 4. However, the only difference being the 4X is constructed with corrosion resistant material. NEMA and the industry defines corrosion resistance as constructed to provide a degree of protection against exposure to corrosive agents such as salt and spray. Um, so once again, brief highlight of all these, uh, the higher you go in the system rating, so one to 12 for indoor, the better protection you're gonna get. And same with outdoor, uh, you have your 3R, your 4, your 4X. As you move up in those numbers, uh, the, the robustness of the enclosure uh, it increases. Um, if you are looking for more information on these enclosure types, NEMA on their website does a great job of breaking these down even more. Um, as well as providing examples of what they look like. Uh, so you can go ahead and go to their website if you need to take a deeper look into this topic. But that's the gist of indoor and outdoor enclosures as defined by NEMA. Like I promised, we would be talking about codes and standards. Uh, so we're gonna start off the conversation with what I'm sure is a very popular uh, code and standards that you guys know all about, and that is NFPA. Um, so before I wrap things up, uh, I briefly wanted to discuss the two most common codes associated with automatic transfer switches and what this means for your emergency power system or your system in general. Uh, so the first code, like I mentioned, is going to be NFPA uh, and most notably NFPA 70 at the top of this slide here or NEC. So when looking into NEC, it is important to focus in on article 700, 701, 702, and 708. These will help guide you into understanding what is required of you based on what type of system you have. So understanding if you have a legal, excuse me, legally required optional or uh, critical operations power system. So that's like what I talked in the middle uh, of this presentation about. So if you wanna know truly what your system is and what is needed of you, and your system, uh, take a look into those articles of NFPA 70 or NEC uh, to get a better understanding of what you need to look for. Next up is NFPA 110. Uh, this is a topic that we could spend a lot of time talking about, and there have been several webinars done on this topic, but the things to note here is that even though you might see NFPA 110 associated with uh, the transfer switch, this code is for the whole entire power system itself. So this means that the NFPA 110 is for the transfer switch and the gen set and so on and everything else that goes with it. 
It is also important to understand uh, when it comes to your system, what type and class your system is according to NFPA 110, because this could affect the starting requirements of your system and when acceptable power needs to be to the low side of the transfer switch. So that could be like a type one, type 60, uh, things like that. And then lastly, we have NFPA 99 there down at the bottom. Um, so this is if you are a healthcare facility. This will help you understand all these special requirements that are needed for your power system within one of these applications. Uh, for example, you can need a bypass transfer switch or you may, may need special enunciation. Um, so to understand if you need one of those two things, take a deeper look into NFPA 99 as well as it splits up uh, your system into three different types. Uh, so if you need to understand what type your system is as defined by NFPA 99, uh, you'll need to go ahead and look deeper into that code. Like I mentioned, while talking about NFPA 110, there have been power hours that have been done on this topic, as well as some white papers. So if you want a better understanding of what NFPA 110 means for your system, feel free to go ahead and read about it if you click on that white paper link, as well as watch an in-depth power hour covering all uh, things associated with NFPA 110 and time to readiness uh, with that link as well. And then next up, we have UL 1008. So the second and last code I will highlight is UL 1008. This is the standard of safety when it comes to the automatic transfer switches and many other things in life. UL tells the manufacturer what is expected of the transfer switch for performance and safety. This is all accomplished by stringent testing, and some of those tests include, but not limited to, temperature rise tests, uh, overload tests, endurance tests, short circuit testing, and more. This is just a brief highlight of UL and what they do and what they mean for your system. If more information is needed on UL 1008 and how you can apply this to your transfer switches, feel free to go ahead and click on those links and get a better understanding by watching some webinars dedicated to this topic. So in closing, when selecting a transfer switch, it is important to take into consideration all of the following things listed here on the slide. You need to be looking at your project and deciding is this a non-automatic or automatic, is a non-automatic or automatic transfer switch needed? Is there a need for a service entrance rated transfer switch or can I get by with a non-service entrance rated transfer switch? Also paying close attention to what application and installation type you are placing this transfer switch into um, and based off of those factors, what transition type best suits this application. So once again, is this a gen to gen application for prime power? Um, is this two redundant utility feeds, uh, or is this just a normal emergency backup um, with a utility with a transfer switch in the middle between that and a genset? Um, and then also understanding, are you legally required? Are you just optional? Are you a farmer that just needs a transfer switch? Um, things like that. And then also, uh, based off of those factors, once again, what transition type do you need? So. If you're in an emergency, do you need that center off position for delays uh, or anything else? Because if so, then you'll need that three position switch, or maybe you don't need the center off and then you'll have to go with that two position switch. And then also, do you need to communicate with the utility and put in extra safeguards if you are providing a closed transition? So being able to think about all those things and understand that if you're choosing a closed transition type or a time delayed transition type, that there are extra steps and uh, things that need to be taken into consideration when applying your automatic transfer switch into an application. Um, and once again, do you need to be looking at getting into a three position transfer switch if you're using an open transition? Also, it is important to take into consideration your grounding scheme. Um, as this could play a huge factor in whether or not you're using a three-pole or four-pole transfer switch. Cable sizing and conduit entry is also an extremely important topic. Um, do you have the right number of cables? Do you have the right size of cables? And are these cables coming from the top, bottom, or other entry points of the transfer switch as those could affect how your transfer switch is placed within your system? And in the case of the enclosure, uh, do you need to take into consideration the environmental factors of your, where your transfer switch is being placed? If indoors, is the need in type 1 or type 12 needed? Are you in a salty environment? If so, maybe you need to look into a NEMA type 3R or a 4-style enclosure. Um, and then lastly, making sure you're looking at the one line 
to make sure you're specifi specifying the right voltage in Hertz uh, for your application and making sure you have all the right ratings and are up to code when it comes to the laws and regulations that govern your transfer switch operation. So with all that being said and done, I hope you guys were able to walk away from today's presentation and get a better understanding uh, of um, kind of describe the, the basic operational features and functions of a working transfer switch, as well as recognize those different installation and application types. And then lastly, identify some of the codes and standards commonly associated with transfer switch applications. And lastly, for your use, additional resources, I linked some things in this presentation. Um, if you want to learn more about some of the subtopics of this presentation, I did link to some past webinars done on those topics if you are wanting a more in-depth look um, at those and learning a little bit more about them. So with that, I will now hand it back over to Amara for some Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Chad. That was a lot of information. And now Chad will answer some questions from the audience. Please type your question for Chad in the ask a question box on your screen. And we'll get to as many as time allows in the next few minutes. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www.csemag.com. And please remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation Use the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. All right, Chad, let's get going on these questions. First question for you. In the case of a closed transition ATS to determine the WCR, the withstand current rating, should the short circuit current level on the emergency side and normal side of the ATS be added or not? Yeah, so uh, UL 1008 does not require, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the questions off. I have a lot of screens going on. Um, UL 1008 does not require testing to simulate those fault conditions when both sources are um, parallel during closed transitions or soft load transition operation. Uh, so this is another reason why uh, UL 1008, which is one of those codes I talked about there at the end of the presentation, uh, listing should not be relied upon for extended paralleling applications, um, uh, as well as it is extended paralleling is is recognized as uh, a failure mode under UL 1008. Um, if the risk assessment shows that there is an unacceptable uh, level of risk for the customer, mitigation methods can be used, um, and some of those mitigation methods. Uh, it could be upsizing your automatic transfer switch um, according to your application or utilizing fault energy. Uh, so upsizing that transfer switch just makes it a little bit more robust and, and can handle things like that. So, All right. Thank you. Next question for you. Is neutral, is that position the only option on a three-position switch? Uh, yeah. So I know I, I cover a lot of switch types and a lot of name types and things like that. Um, but yes, so the, the third position is that neutral. Um, this is important to note uh, because depending on the transfer switch model and manufacturer, uh, if you do order an open transition switch, transition switch, why? A lot of talking. Uh, if you do order a open transition switch, uh, it may come in as a two position switch uh, architecture, um, which can't have that transition mode programmed in it uh, later or have the load shed added later. Um, so it is important to specify whether you need that center off neutral position or a three position switch. And to, to further just confirm uh, the person asked, is the neutral position only a three position switch? Um, yes, sorry, I didn't mean to go into so much detail, but yeah. Thank you, that's great. Uh, okay, next question. You kind of talked about this toward the end of the presentation. Um, in the case of a NEMA 3R enclosure option, is it really an outdoor enclosure suitable for snow and rain? Uh, yeah, so NEMA type 3 R enclosures, uh, per definition, these enclosures are intended to provide a degree of protection against falling 
dirt, rain, sleet, and snow. Um, so reasonable protection between uh, snow and a, and a raining climate. Um, and will be undamaged by uh, internal formation of ice on the enclosure. Um, so it does provide a degree of protection, uh, but it's not the end all be all fix for that. I hope that answers the question, um, but yes. Yeah, okay, thanks for that clarification. All right, next question for you. Is there usually a built-in delay? So some items like a pump or a compressor will stall or overload if a circuit, or overload or stall a circuit if started in mid-cycle. Uh, where normal operation will pause for a short bit, but is measurable, time connecting the power. Can you talk about that delay? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that individual is referring to a time delay transition type. Um, I don't, uh, if they're specifying what is the delay, so the delay is uh, dependent on what you set it as. So you would set it within um, the transfer switch. So the normal source and the emergency source, say the normal source goes out, um, you set a specific time delay within your system um, that you know that the voltage would decay enough so that when the transfer switch closes on to your emergency power source, there is no more uh, residual voltage within your system. Um, so I, I think that answers the question, um, but there is no predetermined preset uh, for every single application. It's all dependent on application type and what you set it as. Uh, refer to your manufacturer um, as they usually have a recommendation as to what the delay should be uh, based on your system. Sure. Okay. Uh, next question here. Why use non-auto versus manual? Yeah. So they, they can kind of sound similar um, in the sense that it's not the transfer switch doing its own thing. Uh, there needs to be human interaction involved. So the non-automatic, uh, you are able to transfer power from a remote location um, or by just clicking a button. Um, whereas with the manual, you have to be there in person every single time, transferring and retransferring power um, to the transfer switch. So. Uh, although they sound similar, they are different. Uh, so, so the manual is, is, I know a lot of times used on farms and things like that. Um, so keep in mind that if you are using a manual uh, transfer switch, like I stated earlier on in the presentation, that your system is, is able to either withstand uh, those kind of power interruptions or uh, you aren't experiencing a lot of them um, so that you don't constantly need to be next to your manual transfer switch, switching and unswitching, uh, or transferring and untransferring power. All right, got it, thank you. All right, I think we, yeah, we have time for one more question, Chad. Um, this last one is, will tripping of an overcurrent protection device upstream of an ATS effectively shut down the operation of the ATS so it will no longer function? Is there a fail safe involved here? Uh, yeah, so um, tripping of the upstream overcurrent protection device or uh, for those on the call who maybe don't know what the overcurrent protection device is, it's a OCPD is kind of the acronym for it. Um, we'll make that source unavailable to the automatic transfer switch and the automatic transfer switch control logic will uh, function accordingly. So an example of this, uh, I think for this question would be in a simple application with your utility, uh, so your normal source and your generator, your backup source, if the utility side of the OCPD is stripped, um, the controller will then send a start command to your uh, generator or your emergency source. Um, when that generator has stabilized, so it has uh, safe power, the automatic transfer switch will then transfer to the generator. Um, however, if the fault uh, that you are talking about was caused, um, which caused the utility or overcurrent protection device to trip is downstream of the automatic transfer switch, um, it would still be in the circuit and the generator OCPD uh, will also trip. Um, so this is one of the reasons why selective coordination, uh, which is a topic all 
um, of its own uh, is so important. Right, right. Yeah. Well, lots of great questions, Chad. Thank you very much. And questions that we didn't get to today, Chad will try to answer as many as possible in writing. So thank you, Chad Hale, for sharing your time and expertise. And thank you to Cummins for sponsoring today's event. And now that we are just about done, we want some feedback. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. And please take a few seconds to complete it because we use this information to improve webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting, Specifying Engineer, and CFE Media and Technology, I'd like to thank you for attending. This is the end of the webcast. Thank you and goodbye.